I continue struggling about God. God exists, God does not exist. If there is a God, what is God like? I do not make much progress and I am not surprised. But the search is exhilarating. I wouldn't stop for the world. I love digging deeply into issues and arguments about God's existence and if God exists, about God's nature or traits. I love scrutinizing the views of philosophers and scientists, theologians and atheists. Perhaps at times I dig too deeply. Perhaps on occasion I should simply absorb, let go, let diverse views about God wash over me while I wonder, what is it about God? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn and Closer to Truth is my obsession to find out. As God is the topic, I shall visit some who sought to enlighten me about God, see if informed cacophony can shake me up, achieve breakthrough. I start with one of my favorite philosophers, Peter Van Inwagen. The first thing to realize is that what we say about the question is going to depend on what we mean by the word. God. If you mean by the word God, an old man who lives in the sky and tosses thunderbolts at evildoers and so on, then you're thinking of him as one physical object among others. You know, you know, can ask what the, the source of the energy in the <laughs> lightning bolts is and why don't objects fall and why aren't they gravitationally attracted towards him and so on. It becomes a purely scientific question. And I suppose the answer to the scientific question is no, there isn't any such being as that. Obviously not. But if you think of God as theists generally, have done, you'll see that he's not a part of the system of objects that make up the world. He is, as they say, omnipresent. But that doesn't mean he's spread out in space like a physical object. Rather, he's omnipresent more or less uh, the way, say, Rembrandt is present at every point in the Night Watch. Uh, that is, he's the author of the whole thing, and his being and his mind are reflected at every point. You can't raise any scientific questions that are uh, relevant uh, to the existence of such a being. That doesn't mean that science is irrelevant to various religious claims, because it obviously is possible for claims uh, to be made by religions that are inconsistent with uh, things science uh, has shown to be true. Uh, what I'm saying is this: just the proposition alone that such a being as this exists, independent of what he may have done or what he may have put into the uh, world, that doesn't seem to be uh, something that can be settled by science at all. Some scientists disagree with that. Yes, yeah, I know, but I, I think that they must be thinking of God as something who's part of the world like the rest of us. Or they could say that the things that this God would do would be reflected in things in the world well, and we don't see those things. This doesn't sound to me at all like an argument for the non-existence of God. This sounds like the following point. If we look around at the world around us, there's no reason. It gives us no reason to suppose uh, that there is such uh, a being as God. And therefore, by some sort of Occam's razor principle yeah. or something, uh, we should assume right. that God doesn't exist. But that's an argument, of course, for the conclusion that we shouldn't assume that God exists. It's not an argument for the conclusion that we should assume that God doesn't exist. It's really an argument, I think, for agnosticism. Fair. Many attempts have been made to turn that argument into an argument for atheism, but it simply can't be done. That is an argument. So what is this God of whom we speak? What can we know of this supposed supreme being? I asked philosopher of religion, Timothy O'Connor, to describe God. God is, in many ways, among the simplest concepts there is. Trying to unpack that, it gets a bit complicated. <laughs> Thinking about God's relationship to time, for example, can God undergo change? These, then, then things get complicated. But at its core, the idea of God is the idea of pure perfection. Why is that? Once you conceive God in this sort of philosophical notion as pure perfection, it gives rise to some interesting arguments that tie into uh, the goal of trying to explain uh, the world around us. Descartes, for example, famous philosopher, uh, held that God, there was an infinity of perfections in God. Mm. And of course, we can't think of infinitely many uh, sorts of properties, so uh, 
virtually all, essentially all of God's nature becomes unknowable to us, only the core attributes. That are these characteristics separable, or are they all kind of I I interwoven so together that you can't have one without the other? I think the latter, because if they were separable, then we would be able to ask questions. Well, why is God the way he happens to be if he might have been without this characteristic or possibly with a characteristic he doesn't in fact have? But God, core to the idea of God um, for philosophical purposes is as the ultimate buck-stopping explanation. And so if, if we conceive God in a way such that it gives rise to explanatory questions, then the concept falls apart. We're driven by our need for God to play a certain fundamental explanatory role in reflecting on the concept of God. We might take back something we might have thought was true of God if we see that this would undermine God's ability to play that role. God to be God must be the ultimate explanation. God must end explanations. How to end explanations? God must be perfect. But what does it take for God to be perfect? God must be infinite. But what kind of mind must an infinite God have? I asked philosopher and Anglican priest, Keith Ward. I see God as an individual, a unified consciousness with knowledge, knowledge of every possible world, and, and a will, a, a causal power which is not physical. So uh, I think God is an individual. I'm a bit reluctant to use the word person because that's so tied up in, in our culture with relationships to other people. I'm one person among others, and that's very important. And God is not one person among others. Individual, yes. Uh, personnel, yes. Because God has thoughts, God has... Uh, intentions. Uh, intentions, yes, and knowledge. Uh, and I think feeling in a certain sense. But some of those things sound anthropomorphic to... Yes. If the objection is that God is a projection of our minds onto the universe, um, I accept that. And I think if you're going to talk about the ultimate nature of the universe, any theory will be a projection of some part of us. The question is, is it going to be the material part or the mental part? <laughs> but you're going to change it as well, because God doesn't uh, think as we do. I mean, God doesn't work out mathematical sums, I presume. And, and God has knowledge of every possible state of affairs. So God's mind, philosophers usually say, is intuitive. If it encompasses everything um, that could be encompassed at all. So it's a very different sort of mind. There is a question whether that makes sense. I mean, can, can you extend the mind so far? Well, I don't see why not, I suppose, uh, since I'm not binding the mind to the brain. I think you could inflate the concept. That's what you're doing and saying, could you have a mind which knew everything and which could, if it wished, intend everything? And I do think that's a possibility. How does that type of God comport with the Eastern religion, cosmic consciousness, which has sort of an impersonal character to it, although it has some of the same characteristics. Yes, I think the uh, God, uh, or Brahman, the absolute reality of uh, many Indian traditions, is uh, always said to be intelligent and blissful, and those are certainly personal characteristics. So, I'm a Christian of a sort, uh, well, I'm a priest anyway, so, <laughs> so um, the sort of view of God that I have is more like Indian views in many ways. God is the mind-like reality at the base of the universe as we see it, not another being out there somewhere, mm. but this being seen in its true and deep, deepest nature. God as being itself is a profound and pervasive concept. It makes God utterly transcendent. How to explore such supreme power? I visit John Polkinghorne, a quantum physicist and Anglican priest. The act of creation was, as the theologians say, an act of kenosis. Kenosis means self-limitation. Nobody limits God from the outside. The attempt to do that is the sinful error of magic. But God bringing into being a world in which creatures are given the gift of freedom, to be themselves, to make themselves, which is the gift of the God of love, that God is vulnerable to the, the circumstances of that world. God is not in total control. God is not the sort of master planner who as well is instantly obeyed in every instance. I mean, I think I can believe that God will fulfill the divine purposes 
but maybe through contingent paths. In other words, I see the history of the universe not as the performance of a score <laughs> that God wrote in eternity, but as an unfolding improvisation. Oh. And I believe that the, the, the great um, cosmic composer will resolve the few at the end of time, <laughs> but it, by contingent means. So your God, the omnipotence, the omniscience, all, yeah. all power and all yeah. knowing, it is more constrained than others. Well, it's very important to understand what you mean when you say that God's almighty. It doesn't mean that God can do absolutely anything. Um, for example, the rational God cannot decree that two plus two equals five. The good God, I believe, cannot do evil deeds. And the God who is the God of love cannot be a cosmic tyrant. There must be some gift of freedom. It's risky, it's vulnerable, and it explains that, that not everything that happens in the world is the fulfillment of God's direct will. I don't believe that God wills either the act of a murderer or indeed the devastation wrought by an earthquake, but God allows both to happen in a creation which has given its freedom to be itself and to make itself. It's part of the experience of religious life that we are free to make decisions and responsible for our decisions, but also when we look back on our lives, we can often see how, and believe we see that God is, has been active and, and, and guiding and leading us in our lives. There is a whole tension between those two. It's a celebrated theological conundrum to get that balance right. Now we see that conundrum written cosmically large in God's relation to the universe. With such diverse views, how then to discern what God really is? One approach is to ask whether God has a nature does God have fundamental features or inherent traits which define God uniquely and without which God would not be God? I asked philosopher Hugh McCann. I think if you want to ask whether God has a nature, in part what, what we're inclined to think is, is it the case that God's nature is imposed on him? And that has two parts. One has to do with the things that God creates, and whether he's forced to create the way he does. And the other has to do with God's own nature, which we don't think he creates himself. That doesn't sound right. So on the first score, if you want to say that it is not forced upon God that he be good as creator or so forth, then you have to adopt a view according to which creation is not a matter of deliberation or prior planning or choosing among prior plans and then pulling a universe into existence, that's not creation, that's manufacturing or, or conjuring or something like that. In creation, the plan comes with the product. And so in that situation, then there is no prior constraint on God as to what he may do. But if you, if you turn to God's own nature and say, okay, well, is, is it really up to God whether he's internally good? Is it up to God whether he's a creator? Is, is it up to God whether he has a will? Or is it up, you know, that sort of thing. That's a little bit harder, but there is a way to do it, and, and, and the way is to treat God not as a being who acts, but to treat him as the action itself. So if you look at God as an act of will, then you might say something like this, that God as an act of will that has intrinsic intentionality belongs to him. Even though God does not bring himself into existence, he's not self-creating in that sense, nevertheless, he means to be everything he is. And that's intrinsic to his nature. If we take God basically as, as an instance of willing, then even if God does not bring himself into existence, neither is he stuck with himself. Because an act of will is a spontaneous thing, first of all, and it's something that we mean to be engaged in. So what you have is a God who is spontaneously all that he is and means to be that, even though he's not bringing himself into existence. It means nothing counts as, counts as a way he's inclined to be. Nothing counts as a way he's inclined to act. They're only his actions. Nothing counts as an intention that he may or may not put into action because all of his intentions are realized. And, and so what does that mean about God's nature, ultimately? What it means is that it's a nature that, that is in accordance with his will, even though it is not produced by him. Hugh expands my thinking on what God, if there is a God, may be about. How is God not limited by God's own nature? Could God's essence be pure will and action? Will seems the personification of personhood. But if I seek truth about God, why limit the search? There are alternatives to a theistic God. I visit philosopher John Leslie, co-editor of The Mystery of Existence. We could define God for our purposes as going beyond what science tells us about. 
One way of going beyond it is to say that there's a personal creator behind everything. Another is saying that science describes the pattern of the world and God somehow underlies that pattern. Another is saying that the explanatory factor is something very abstract, that God is pure being. And it's not clear, therefore, that God really exists. God might be some sort of force. You could think that God is the most important thing in the universe without being a personal being. There's also the question of whether God is a being at all, whether God is somehow beyond existence, or whether God is pure being in such a way that our normal concepts of a being just don't apply. And what does that mean? That means that that we can't understand it, or we can understand it, but none of our categories apply. I think that we can't understand it would be the answer that somebody like Aquinas would give. But at the same time, we can get an idea of what's going on with the help of analogies. God is in some way loving. God is in some way highly intelligent. God is able to act in the way in which a good person could act. But those sound very personal. Well, they do sound very personal, but when the people who are developing them say all the time, remember, this isn't a person. (laughs) (laughs) So how would we differentiate? It sounds like a distinction without a difference. Well, you could go all the way back to Plato and say that what is producing the universe is a force of value, and the force of value produces the best, and it's producing the best in the way in which somebody who knew what was best would be producing the best. Even but, though in that case there's no person involved. Even though no person is involved. So that sounds like a personal attitude without a person. That sounds a little strange. It's a factor producing things which a good and wise, knowledgeable person would produce without being a person at all. Mm. But when you go into the schools of theology, that's all up for grabs. You can have it any way you want. John is rather missionary that value or the good is the universal key to unlock the mystery of existence, the existence of everything the cosmos included. To me, if I had to pick a universal key, a candidate would be the relationship between God and time. Time is a litmus test of what God could be about. I see the agnostic philosopher Robin Le Poitevin, who is not sure about God, but who starts with time. It's entirely true to say that the orthodox philosophical conception of of God is of this this timeless being. It's almost as if God is some kind of abstract object, like a number. If you're talking about orthodoxy within a living faith, um, I think you might get a rather different picture, um, a living faith like Christianity, for example, where God is not seen in these very abstract terms, but a person with whom one can interact, someone who will actually communicate with you, someone who feels your suffering. What about this concept of, of value and uh, goodness as being not just something pleasant, but being really the progenitor of everything, including possibly even God? I have to confess that I have a problem with the idea that the the world uh, could exist because it's good that it it does. Here we're thinking of goodness as a kind of creative agency. Now, we can't think of that in causal terms because a cause is something that exists and it's uh, something that exists before, typically, the thing that it brings into existence. We should not think of the creative agency of uh, of goodness in causal terms, uh, but in teleological terms. So that is in terms of of purpose. Now, we we do engage in teleological explanations uh, all the time. Why are you running around the park because I want to get fit. The fitness is the is the goal. It's something that doesn't already exist. It's not bringing into being your running. So that's a teleological explanation. It's not a causal explanation. And if you're talking about a cause of the universe, a cause of the universe is going to be unlike any other cause. I don't think it follows that there couldn't be an explanation of why anything exists that isn't in some respect like other explanations that we use. Mm-hmm. 
When considering the entire cosmos, Robin thinks differently about cause, more as a reason than as a mechanism. So could God be the reason, even if physics were the mechanism? Or is this too convenient a compromise? Still, could a human mind ever contemplate a divine mind? I ask Christopher Knight, executive director of the International Society of Science and Religion, about the Christian tradition. Many of the early Christian creeds and liturgies actually stressed that God was incomprehensible. And there was a very strong sense in a lot of early Christian thinking that the language we use, it often tells you what God isn't rather than what God is. That, I think, is an absolutely essential first step, that we're never going to understand God, and no language we ever use can circumscribe the reality. Now, the second thing is, I think, that there's always been a a tension between those who want a rather simple anthropomorphic picture of God, you know, the person who acts in the world much as any other person acts in the world, and those who have said, no, hang on, we cannot talk about God in terms of other things in the world, as though he's simply a thing among things. And there have been lots of people in the Judeo-Christian world and beyond who have wanted to say, we've got to talk about God in terms of the ground of being, of being itself, of existence itself, if you like. Um, and yet somehow both of those types of language which are in tension do sum up something of what certainly the traditional religious understanding of God has been. It's not just a vague philosophical understanding. I certainly don't believe, for example, that there is a natural theology where we can go from what we know about the world and somehow argue ourselves into believing in the existence of God. Whatever it is that makes people like me believe in God, it's not ultimately a rational argument. It may be partly that, but it's something else. It's something which is much more deeply personal. What's sometimes spoken of as a sort of gestalt conversion, where we suddenly see the world in a new way. You're not seeing anything different, and yet somehow it's completely different. That, to me, is very much what that sort of transition from just looking at the world without God and looking at the world with God, so to speak, is about. Here's what bothers me. When we begin to search for God, why do we always begin within our own religious tradition? I ask Robert John Russell, a minister with a doctorate in physics who seeks creative mutual interaction between science and religion. Well, I think I'll start with in the Judeo-Christian tradition, God acting in history, God even acting in nature as, say, ongoing creator. So in, in a certain sense, the, the spectrum goes from fully transcendent other worldly God, the holy other, to a more and more imminent divine nature or spirit, till in a certain sense you lose the transcendence. But why should I be centered in my own tradition? Why should that be the center of my ultimate beliefs of, of, of transcendent reality? That's just a coincidence of birth. You're right. And I mean, that's why conversions happen. What I'm, I'm not saying it's to stay with your own tradition. I'm saying you begin where you're planted and then grow and see where it takes you. On the one hand, we're talking about if God exists at all. We're talking about something which is absolute mystery, which is the ground of our being. We have no experience of that, right? It's not like where I came from or where I'm going to. It's something wholly transcendent and utterly different. And yet that God, if we know anything at all about God through God's own revelation, is so intimate to our lives that we can truly discover our God in our prayer life, in our most intimate family relations, in our daily living. So diversity of ways to articulate that, the theological differences, on the one hand is sort of disconcerting because you think, well, why would there be so many radical differences from deism on the one hand to process panentheism on the other? And on the one hand, I'm not surprised because the, the discussions about this concept, which is intrinsically mysterious, on the other hand, that shouldn't be an excuse for irrational thinking and saying, oh, well, you know, let, let a, a thousand flowers bloom. I mean, in the end, there are big differences. I'm trying to take seriously the diversity of views about God. And it's a balance between taking them seriously, yet honoring the difference in the way. So others take them seriously. That's the tension to do theology. I start a fresh search for God. I've started this before, not with success. So now I try divine diversity, competing ideas about God. I, like most human beings, have a penchant for God or something like God. As for why this penchant, I can't distinguish between evolutionary pressure or divine implantation or both. So 
What are some competing ideas about God? God is not another object in existence. God is pure perfection. God encompasses every fundamental philosophical problem from time to consciousness. God is self-limiting, vulnerable. God is not a being who acts, but the action itself. God is value. God is variegated. God is incomprehensible. God is at once transcendent and imminent. Can all these be coherent? Can all these work together in harmony and bliss? I'd hope so, but I'd better be sure so, getting closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.